I was gonna say, how did how did that turn out for you? <laughs> I'm hitting a brick wall every time, bro. So I'm like, wait a minute, something's not right. And welcome back to the show. Be successful. I'm your host, Brian Elam. I help entrepreneurs with a heart of service spiritually align their business and create powerful and impactful messaging using the power of conversation to flip the marketing world on its head. Today, I am super excited and very thankful to have Oliver here. Oliver is a husband, a father, a coach, a mentor, and all around just a great human being. Him and his wife have been doing relationship coaching and mentoring for years now out of just a passion to help people connect more deeply and have the best relationship of their lives and has recently discovered a passion within himself for helping men overcome the what he calls the man laws that are keeping them stuck, unmotivated, and just not moving forward in life. So we are going to get into those today, and I am super grateful to have you here, Oliver. Thank you so much for being here. Man, thank you. Listen, it's my pleasure. I am excited to, you know, hang out with you today, man, and just have just have some some conversation that um, I'm sure will be enriching not only to us, but to to your audience as well. So thank you for having me. Oh, at my pleasure. My pleasure. So let's just get right into it. Um, starting towards the beginning. How did you and your wife come to understand that you had something important to share with other people that could impact their relationship and their life. Listen, it's interesting you would ask that, right? Because in the beginning, we, what this has turned into, we would have never envisioned. So <clears throat> to go back to about 2013 or so, we were involved in, in a marriage group. Now we weren't the leaders, we were just participants like everybody else but we'd have people come and tell us hey you know what we love your marriage your marriage is a ministry and you know my wife and I are looking at each other like they, they're talking to us <laughs> are, are you sure you got the right person <laughs> you know and and so we decided with that you know hearing that so much we said you know what let's just start a blog that's it I'm going to start a blog I was following a good friend of mine who was doing well <clears throat> in the blogging space and so we say, you know what, let's just write about our experience. If somebody reads it and it resonates with them, then great. And that's literally, Ryan, that's literally all we had. That's all I had in mind. Then fast forward 2015, somebody asked us to speak. Again, we're flabbergasted. Like, to who? <laughs> like, wh what are you talking about? You want us to get in up there? Like, no, I don't want to do that, you know. But that was the turning point that kind of got us to like, wait a minute, there's something more for us to do here. It's not, you know, we may not see it, but obviously there's something more. And so that was a turning point in 2015. And then from there, we started a podcast, started doing some stuff on YouTube. And then around 2017 or so, it kind of flipped into coaching because people were asking, hey, can we, you know, can we sit with you? Do you coach people? Can, can we sit with you and talk with you about some stuff? And now here we are, man, just this thing is kind of, ballooning if you will mushrooming or whichever word you want to use and now we're in the coaching space pretty heavy and uh the book for men came about because you mentioned that in the in the intro in 2017 i spoke for a singles retreat and they did breakout sessions and so i was the speaker for the guys when they when they did the breakout sessions and i talked about what i call the unwritten man rules and I came home, told my wife, I said, man, that would make a great book. And I started it, but I never finished it. <laughs> so fast forward to 2020, I actually finished the book, Overcoming the Man Laws. And that's been, you know, a journey, has taken me now on a journey of really being able to talk with men and sit down and really kind of dig into some of the things that we grapple with and, and helping men to really get over that hurdle sometimes that keeps them in the same place. Excellent. And these, these unwritten man rules, is this something that you discovered through your own personal journey? Or was this something that you got, you know, came to light through your work with the relationship coaching? 
my personal journey, 100%. The book is literally my journey of self-discovery in eight areas that I grappled with. So the book, it, it, and it's a chapter on each one. So leadership, mental stamina, relationships, faith, trust, respect, altruism, and authenticity. It's literally my journey of self-discovery. And there's some things that I was taught all men are, you can think of a man law, right? That you either were taught or was just kind of passed down or you learned by, you know, observation in the neighborhood or whatever. And they're not all bad, but some of them I, I didn't realize until I got married. Some of them were detrimental to my success as a husband and father. So there was some unlearning that I had to do. And then there was some relearning that I had to do. So I took five of the many, many lessons that, that I've learned over the years and broke them out into those eight pillars. When I looked at those five lessons, I was like, okay, these are essentially the eight things that I have grappled with. And sometimes to this day still do grapple with. And so, yeah, from my 100%, my own experience. Right. Well, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. So let's start with what you think is the most, I guess you would say important or the most prevalent man rule that if someone wants to improve that they ought to take a look at and perhaps reframe their life around that's a great question i'll tell you the one that stands out one of the lessons that i put in the book is that you can't demand or you shouldn't demand something you haven't first developed so I, i'll tell you what that's all about in reference to me is that I kind of grew up with this ideology that men just, you're just going to automatically garner respect just based on your role. And that's not something that was actually verbally taught to me, but in my, in my culture, my parents are West Indian. So they're from the Caribbean. And you see in the Caribbean culture often that the man is king so it didn't even really in some cases didn't even really matter how great of a guy they were or how dependable they were or how much integrity they had they just kind of commanded the space just because of who they were so what you say goes this is how these things are going to be run everything's going to kind of fall in line with their their vision and so i kind of took that and ran with that because that's kind of what I saw. So now fast forward, I'm married. I'm trying to apply that <laughs> ideology and I'm hitting a brick wall every time. I was going to say, <laughs> like, how did, how did that turn out for you? <laughs> I'm hitting a brick wall every time, bro. So I'm like, wait a minute, something's not right. Either this is not what it's supposed to be, or I'm not what I'm supposed to be. And so now I'm realizing, okay, if I want some level of respect, I need to show some level of respect. If I want to be trusted, I need to be trustworthy, you know? And, and so that's kind of where that came from that, listen, I, I can't be out here demanding stuff from folk. And I haven't even taken the time to develop those characteristics within myself. And it was that feedback basically, or that brick wall that you were talking about from, mm. from your wife, from your relationship that clued you into the fact that there's something wrong here. Like this may work in a previous cultural setting, a previous family dynamic, but for some reason it ain't working here. So something needs to be done. Yeah. You know, it wasn't necessarily like a, a deep, insight that you know you had to go in and meditate for years and figure it out it's like no it's like here it is right in your face this ain't working yeah. <laughs> and listen after a while you hit a brick wall long enough you're gonna be like okay what what is the next thing like <laughs> there has to be something different than this and then so that that's really what it was for me just looking around and and really doing some self-evaluation because what what tends to happen, and I've heard a lot of people say this, is that when they start to really evaluate these experiences, they realize that the common den denominator is themselves. So I for and I and I didn't really it took me a little while because initially I'm placing blame everywhere else. 
well, she's not doing this. And well, my parents aren't doing that. And, you know, my boss didn't, you know, it was everybody else. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the guy in all of these scenarios. Like I'm the person in every one of these scenarios. So what should I really be doing? You know, and that, and that was one, that was one of the things that really made me turn inward. The other thing that made me turn inward was that we had small, uh, our daughters were small around this time that I was, you know, going through grappling really heavy with all of this stuff. Our daughters were small. And I remember coming in late one was really early in the morning, but like maybe three, four in the morning one night, I remember coming in and I was sitting on the couch and I was thinking to myself, man, if my daughters were to grow up and bring a version of me at that time home, I would be livid. Mm. And then the next, I didn't even know what the answer to this next question is, but the next question I asked myself was, okay, well, what do I need to do? I didn't know the answer at the time, but that was the, the question that made me kind of go on this quest of, okay, you, there's something different you have to do. Now go figure it out. Yeah. So often in life, it, it's the quality of the questions that we ask that determine the quality of the outcomes that we get. And a, a very common misnomer is that you need to, have to, should know the answer to the question immediately after you ask it. And I mean, here, here, folks, right here is living proof that that is not the case. You do not have to have the answer, and you can still find success out of that question that you don't know the answer to right away. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I see that often with the guys I've been able to sit with is that they're beating themselves up because they don't have a solution. And I'm telling them the fact that you're even – in this moment right here with me is an indication that you are facing the right direction. So it's not about making a discovery and then the tail end of making that discovery now is success in an area or mastery in a particular scenario. It's not that it's the beginning. It's the actual beginning of the journey. It's funny when, when we, uh, a few years ago, no, it's a little bit more than that. Now I'd say maybe about 10, 12 years ago, this guy told us, he said, listen, a lot of people equate getting married to reaching the pinnacle of Mount Everest. He was like, nah, man, you are literally just pulling up to base camp. It's just the beginning of the journey. So the question is the beginning of the journey for me that night at four in the morning where I was like, nah, I don't, I cannot allow my daughters to go through that. Like, okay, what do I need to do? That's the beginning. It took, it took several years from that four o'clock in the morning moment to get to the point where I was like, okay, I, I can't, I'm kind of feeling my way through this now. You know, there was some self-discovery that happened. There was some self-actualization that happened. There was some assessment that happened. There was me really kind of grappling with commitment and what that looked like. And was I built for it? And was I going to follow through? And that's really what the book is about. And all of those different areas, man, it, how was my faith? Is that? And I'm still growing in that area. I could probably write three more chapters on faith between 2020 and now, um, but, you know, what's my leadership style? You know, the mental stamina piece was huge. It was a piece that I had ignored completely. I mean, ignored completely until like 2015. And then going through an experience, realizing, man, I had suppressed all this stuff that I had, that I had gone through. So just a lot of things, man. It's a journey. It's an ongoing journey. But the, here's the thing that distinguishes you from being a great man or a non-great man. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> I don't want, yeah. want to call anybody any names. The, the distinguishing thing is that once you face in the right direction, that you keep putting one foot in front of the other in that direction. Mm -hmm. That's the distinguishing thing because it, it's not 
it's a journey that's ongoing. Just like I just said, there's some things I'm still grappling with, but I'm still determined and still, still committed to being putting in that consistent effort in the same direction that I'm now facing. And so to anybody who's listening, man, that that's really what you, you want to strive for. It's not, have I, it's not, have I made the mark? It's, am I consistently reaching for that mark? Because that's going to put you in a position to continually grow. That's going to put you in a, in, in, in a position to, to continually absorb and look inward and gain that level of self-discovery that you need that allows you to take that next step. And before you, before you know it, like, think about it. If you go outside of your house right now and you just start putting one foot in front of the other, and you do that for the next four hours, you're going to look up and be like, man, I'm kind of far from home. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? And so, and it's the same thing. You're going to look up one day and be like, wow, this is dope. We've, 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 we've come a long way. And then for you just real. keep doing it again. That's right. That's right. And I just want to tack on to that point you just made right there at the end. As you do this journey, as you walk that path, it's not to say that you won't get to where you originally wanted to make that mark. Mm -hmm. You'll get there so long as you keep putting one foot in front of the other. But here's the fun thing, that there's always going to be a next mark. There's That's always right. the next level. So you... Just like the work always continues. The journey always continues. So you'll get to where you want to go, that spot that you have in your mind right now. But the beautiful thing is there's always another level if you want it and you can keep marching on. And okay, got to go back for just one second to, uh, to if I can remember that far back, because there's a lot of gold that we just <laughs> went through right there. Um, so men, ah, that's what it is. Men are very solution oriented yes you know and i'm sure you can resonate and like nod your head with this yes, a woman a, a woman tells a guy about her day about this situation this problem that she had and the male oh well here's how you solve that problem well that's not what she wanted she wanted you to listen to her to yeah to resonate to understand not to solve it, but that's how we're wired. So in that is the, the recognition of that, is that one of the unwritten man rules or laws, or is that a, just, just a kind of a catalyst or a piece that we have to remain aware of as we navigate through all of those laws? I think it's closer to the latter because that is something that's kind of like you, to use your word, we're wired that way. That's part of the fabric of who we are. What we have to now do is learn techniques that allow us to show up in that way when we're needed, but also to show up in the way that our mates or other people may need us to show up. And so what, I, what I've been teaching couples to do and, and having men do is forego your knee-jerk reaction in that scenario that you just described, mm -hmm. right? Knee-jerk reaction is, hey, okay, well, do this, 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 and this, and you're going to be good. Believe me, I've done it a million times. <laughs> and out of that million times, about 900,000 of those times, that's not what was called for, <laughs> right? What I'm doing now is that I'm foregoing my knee-jerk reaction. And that takes some level of discipline, and you, you learn that level of discipline and self-control over time and trial and error. But forego your, forego your knee-jerk reaction replace that with an active listening response. So what does that look like? So tells me about the day, tells me about these things that happen at work. This happened. Oh, on the way, this on the way home, this happened, this happened. So my active listening response is going to be something like, wow, babe, man. So I kind of what I'm hearing you say is that like, there was a lot happening today and, and this is how you felt about it. And I would just basically kind of summarize what she said. As crazy as that sounds, I'm repeating basically what she said to me, right? But then what it allows her to do is to either clarify if I didn't get it right or to agree. And that agreement in and, in and of itself, that acknowledgement and that agreement now takes a little bit of the pressure off just enough for her to say what 
tack on what is the need that she's trying to express. So let's say she let's say I don't get it right. Now that gives her a chance to clarify. Well, no, that's not really what I was saying. It was kind of like this, 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 and this. Or she can be like, yeah, man, I, I, you're right. It was. I think I need, I need a break. Now, what I'm wired to do, now it probably becomes appropriate because now I can be like, oh, okay, you need a break. All right, don't worry about it. I got dinner. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take care of this. I'll, I'll take the car over to, to get the oil changed. You go ahead and, you know, do you go out with your girlfriends or whatever. And now you've averted that and still kind of did what you do best. Right. Right. It's just recognizing where to place that in to the conversation, into the dynamic versus, like you said, going with that knee jerk, hardwired reaction of wanting to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. That has, that has helped me a lot. And I've, I've noticed with a lot of couples that we work with, that has been a game changer for them because what here's let's play the scenario out the other way, right? You, you dive in and now, now she's here. She's mad. Like, that's not what I was asking you to do. I just wanted you to listen. And blah, blah, blah. now we're in, now we're in a whole nother zone. We're in argument zone. And now we got to deal with the fallout from the argument. And then probably we'll still have to circle back to whatever the issue was <laughs> once we deal with the fallout. So now you've right. compounded this thing in a way that is just not good for anybody involved. Yep, absolutely. And does that, this scenario that we're talking about right now, does, the, does that work into the first uh, man rule that we were talking about is like you have to or need to show up as you want to be like you need to put out what you want back in return does does this scenario kind of fall into that it, it does it does in a way because especially when you start really getting to know yourself as a man you're going to realize there are some vulnerabilities there that maybe you either ignored or suppressed and one of those vulnerabilities is that, man, I want to feel that level of acknowledgement, not acknowledgement myself, truth be told. Right. And so that now learning how to do that for someone else. And accompanied with you learning more about yourself and, and how that need benefits you now allows you to articulate that in a way that doesn't come across as like this barking orders kind of thing. And so it does help to do that. And as we dive a little bit deeper into that, recognizing what you need, what do you view as maybe the second, the second law that needs to be discussed in order to start becoming that better man that you want to see and having the better life that you want to, to move towards? If I had to pick another one to put in number two, there's a quote from George McDonald that I love that I use in the book. And it says, it is better to be trusted than to be loved. Now, that's a lesson that I learned kind of the hard way, I guess you could say. Because it's, um, when you think, when you hear it, it sounds poetic in nature, but then you're like, wait a minute, really? Like, that's kind of counterintuitive to what we've been taught. That's, like, that's exactly where my mind went is like, when yeah. you said that, I was like, yeah, that's poetic, but uh, wait a minute. <laughs> exactly. I, I, uh, I kind of want to be loved, you know? <laughs> right. right. Listen, I had the same, I had the same reaction. And then as I kind of dug into where I was as a man, I realized the significance of that statement, right? L love is, is an emotion. What, what, what people can kind of we can grapple with that what it is and what it isn't right but for i'll say that it's an emotion however that emotion aligns with some different variables so even though as christians because I'm, I'm 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 a man of faith so to put it in the christian context you're supposed to love everybody so that means that love that you have for everybody doesn't align with any variable. So that means you could be the greatest person in the world. 
you could be the absolute worst person in the world, but my faith now dictates that I should love you. In the romantic world, it's not like that. If you're the worst person in the world, there's a good chance that love is not aligned to that. Right. However, what I recognize is that trust and respect are they are aligned to a lot of people's most important emotional needs. And typically, you fall in love with the person who meets your most important emotional needs consistently. You tend to fall in love with them. Mm. So as you're building trust, the other thing is a byproduct. However, trust is not always a byproduct of love because love depending on what it's aligned to, if love is just, if I fall in love with this woman because and I, that I meet in the club, she just looks fantastic. And I'm just smitten and all of the endorphins and the dopamine and all of that has taken over, you know, and it comes out my mouth as, man, I love you. That's not going to produce trust. But if I build trust over time, by a lot of different things, consistency, and I'm continually showing up and I'm being here for you and I'm doing this and I'm fulfilling and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm facilitating these most important emotional needs. One day I look up and I'm like, man, I love this person. And for me, I'm just going to speak from my own experience. I tried to do it the other way mm. and it didn't work. And then I realized, well, I'm not <clears throat> going back to the first one. I'm not even presenting myself in a way that would present me as being trustworthy. I wasn't building trust at all, but I was expecting it to be built for me based on other things that I was providing or other things that I felt like were more important. So that's one that I grappled with a lot. And then realized, you know, once I started being consistent, that the trust started to be built because the building blocks of trust is consistency. So once I started being consistent, trust started to be built. And the more she, tr so I'm speaking now from the romantic relationship perspective, the more she trusted me, it seemed like the more she, she loved me. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm seeing a pattern here that I didn't see previous. So. That, that's the one that um, the trust and respect piece, I guess that would be two and three. There's a chapter on, in the book on each one because those were two that I grappled with as well. But yeah, that's my, that's my take on George McDonald's quote. It is better to be trusted than to be loved. Now we need to be loved, Brian. Let's be clear. Yes. We need that. Absolutely. We need that. But the trust piece is, is foundational. Um, if you think about building a house, <clears throat> I would say trust is the foundation. And love is part of the other components that are built on that foundation. If you take that foundation out, it, everything else is wobbly at that point. Absolutely right. And, and like I say, initially, when you mentioned that quote, you know, the, it had that, that kind of knee jerk, like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right moment. But then a couple seconds later, after I was able to think through it a little bit more deeply, I totally understood Yep. what he meant and you you articulated it beautifully with that that house analogy of trust being the foundation and love being built on top of that and if you like you said if you remove it then yep. you know who knows if it's going to stand up you know yep. it's, a it's year hit. later a minute later that's right it's hit or miss at that point yeah yeah it can definitely lead it definitely lead to that Man, I'm telling you, like, there are so, it's so interesting, the, I, I would say the natural inclinations that men have in order to, like, solve problems, be providers, go out there and, and kill the bison and drag it back, and you should love me for that, you know, all this, all this stuff that we, we're just genetically, genetically hardwired to have as as we think is what a good provider is, a good husband, a good community member is. And it's just, it's so much more than that. It it's is so much more than that. It is. And 
And I'm glad you said that, right? Because something that I noticed a lot of men grapple with, and I did too as well, is that we've been handed a role, just like what you said. You describe, you just described it. We've been handed this role where we are the conqueror, we are the king, we are the provider, we are the protector. All of those uh, attributes, we don't ever tell guys that there is a, there's a human side to all of those very uh, superhero type attributes. We don't ever talk about the human side. And so we spend so much time trying to be the superhero that we don't spend enough time developing the human side of that. There is a Clark Kent and it's okay. Like he, he, he needs his role is valuable. Right. You know, and we don't always talk about that. And then when we get burned out and we don't know where to turn to, we don't want to tell anybody that because the conqueror, the king, the provider, the protector is not supposed to look that way. And so now who do we turn to? And then we internalize that anguish and try to filter it through getting even harder. Oh man, that's so true. So true. And that cycle continues. We get harder, but the, the extra hardness adds extra stress. We don't have anywhere to put that. So we internalize that and we get harder to cover that up. And then by the time you get to, you know, 40, 45, 50 years old, you're trying to chisel through this decades of just suppressed, crystallized, cemented, craziness that's been going on inside of you to try to get back to the core of who you are. And so I tell a lot of younger guys, listen, man, you can be all of those things and still be vulnerable and still be uh, compassionate. And, and it's not a, it's not a sign of weakness and it's not a, it's not you wearing a sign on your head that says, take advantage of me it, it you can it doesn't mean any of that you know and so we 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 have to do a better job of really you know letting guys know that it's okay that's part of the package don't ignore that because you pay a higher price on the back end yeah you absolutely do um i have personal experience with that that very thing that we're just talking about because when i was um Years ago, I was stuck in a dead-end job, and I knew it was a dead-end job when I took it, but it was a steady paycheck, so I, I took it. You know, no big deal. But I stayed there about two years too long. And so at the end of that fourth year, um, I had basically, just like what you were talking about, I had suppressed all of this drive, all of this emotion that I was meant for more, that I needed to be moving out of there to move on to do what I'm doing now coaching people, helping people grow their business and be successful. I was meant to do that, but I wasn't. And I was suppressing that need. And I stuffed that need down for two years and mm. just got harder and harder. But for me, it didn't become an impenetrable shell. For me, I cracked. Wow. And I went home one day because I was sick and I never went back because my body had just gotten to the point where it's like, okay, you're not going to listen to what you're supposed to listen to. I'm going to shut you down. And so yeah. I, I, I got sick. I developed anxiety out of that situation. And once I learned that it's what I was dealing with, anxiety, I didn't want to tell anybody mm -hmm. because I thought it would make me appear weak. And I'm supposed to be strong. I grew up in a family where I was the first child. I was independent. I didn't have to rely on my parents to buy me stuff if I wanted. I bought my first car when I was 16 before I even had my license. Wow. I had my first car because I was working since 13. And telling somebody that I had anxiety 
no, 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 no. That's just, I can't let people know that I'm weak like that. Yeah. But what I found is when I finally decided to be open about it, people connected with me and resonated with me in a way that I had never experienced. Wow. And it was, it was beautiful. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. And I get emotional talking about it because of how powerful it was, not because I'm sad about that situation, just of the beauty of being able to connect deeper with people. Yeah. So it's That's not a awesome. weakness. It's not a weakness. Not not at all. And and your emotion is proof of that. Because we have to be able to feel in order to survive. We have to be able to feel in order to survive. Think about the person who, who has a um, severe case of diabetes. Mm. And you hear about these cases all the time where they just have their arm over the stove and don't realize that their arm is burning because they can't feel it. Ugh. You have to feel in order to survive. You have to. If not, you get swallowed up in whatever's going on around you. And so that's when you understand that that is that is as paramount to your survival as is the need for strength and to be uh, powerful and to provide and to conquer and to be king. When you realize that, then you experience that beauty that you just described. And yeah. it's, it's a great thing, man. It's a, it's a life-changing moment. 100%. 100%. Life-changing moment. Yeah. And it, it puts you, in my opinion, and you can let me know if you agree, but in my opinion, it puts you on the path to have more in your life. It, that, like, that openness, that ability to, to feel and, and be vulnerable, it allows more abundance into your life. Yeah. I agree 100% because it frees you of some other things. And once you get freed of those other things, now you have the capacity, you have the room to now take on what you need to take on that's beneficial for your soul, right? Mm -hmm. And that freedom, the things that you free up also clears your vision. It gives you some level of clarity to be able to now recognize the beauty in other moments and other people. Mm. Yes. Yes. I didn't, I didn't necessarily equate it to clarity. I just called it empathy, but mm -hmm. you're, you're right. It is also a level of clarity. That's amazing. I'm going to have to internalize that and let that process for a little bit. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's a very deep revelation, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And isn't, if I remember right, clarity, isn't that one of the, the things that you help people with as well, like becoming, getting more clear? Yeah, that's that's one of the things. So my, <clears throat> my goal, so that the t-shirt I have on says 2020 before hindsight, that comes straight out of the book. So my... Um, in, in dedicating the book, one of the people I dedicated to is my son and those who are like him in his age group. He's 19. He was 17 at the time when I wrote the book. <clears throat> and I said, may you achieve 2020 long before hindsight. Because a lot of what I'm writing in the book is because of mistakes that I've made and mm. things that I did not do right and things that I've that I learned on the back end. And so now in hindsight, I'm paying for some, still paying the consequence for some of those things, even though I've turned them around. My goal is to help at least one person gain some level of clarity that allows them to skip some of the pitfalls that would eliminate them having to live in hindsight in at least one area of their lives. And that's the hallmark of a coach right, right. there, you know? We've been through some stuff. We want to help people avoid those pitfalls. Just like, you know, I, I had to shut my first business down because <clears throat> I really didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen to anybody else. Yeah. So if I can be of service in that way, that's why I'm here. 
and you're here to help men and relate and in their relationships help have that 2020 before hindsight, Indeed. which is great. Yes, sir. But Hello. immediately, like <laughs> immediately my mind went to 2020. Hmm. That's an interesting number <laughs> because that's when we all got shut down. Yep. And for a lot of people, myself included, when we got the chance to go inward and figure out what are, we, what are we doing here? Is is what we're doing really working? Really what we want to be doing? So that's that's immediately where my mind went to when I saw the 2020. But I love I love what it actually means. Yeah, and and you're right though because it it was an opportunity for a lot of us to go inward, and that's just to to bring it full circle. That is a great uh, example of the fact that this is an ongoing journey. Because I'll give you an example. 2020, we in 2020, that was our 20th year of marriage. We learned something significant about each other in that year because the pandemic changed our changed our schedules, changed the way we interact throughout the day. And we realized that there were some things we weren't, we had not been intentional about. And it wasn't on purpose. It was just because our routines dictated a certain way of life from us. And we had gotten used to that. And learning and making and turn, like you said, turning inward and like, wait a minute, this, this moving forward has to be different. What does different look like? You know, and so it, it's, a, it's, it's going to be a constant learning process that as long as you have made up in your mind that, hey, you know what? I want to show up as the best version of myself. How do I do that? And as long as you stay consistent with following through on the how do I do that? You're going in the right direction. I love, I love the way that you just brought it right back around. That was so, like, so succinct, so perfect. And we got some great tips. We got some great tips here, people, from Oliver today. So um, next up, how in the world do people get in touch with you, go deeper with you? How can these, these men, these people in these relationships, how can they start with you, get your book, all of this stuff? Because we want it. We need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the best way, I'd say the central hub would be the website, which is Denali, D-E-N as in Nancy, O-L-I dot org. And we're on all social media on LinkedIn. It's all the same. It's at Denali LLC. So, uh, but the central hub is there from there. You can get to YouTube, you can get to, which we're building that community now. So I would encourage anybody who really wanted to connect with us to head over to our YouTube channel, which is again, youtube.com slash Denali LLC. Everything's Denali LLC. Um, but the website is the central hub. So you can start there and kind of branch out from there. Perfect. Perfect. And that link, of course, I'll put in the description below. That way it can reach out to you, go deeper into your work and just level up, level up as men, level up as human beings yeah. and just create a better life for themselves, their families, their work, wherever it is that you need to improve. Oliver's here to help you make it happen. That's my, that's my goal, man. As you, and, and, you know, you, you understand the passion behind why we do what we do, man. It's, it's just been to, to come from, you know, 2013, not realizing any of this was even a possibility to now understanding that, you know, this is, this is part of what I've been built for. It has been a great experience. It's been, it's been as much of an experience for me as it has been for the folk who I sit with. 100%. I, I have become a better person. I have become a better person without a doubt. And so I'm loving the journey that I'm on and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm yelling out the window. Hey, come on, get in the car with me. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with this, I think with this episode, you're going to have a lot more people that want to jump in that car and get on going down the road. So I, I do, I wish you all the best and thank you so much for giving your time, your value and your inspiration. I deeply appreciate it. Man, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right, folks, 
links below. Oliver's here for you. I'm here for you. We're all rooting for you. We're all cheering for you. And we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thanks so much, guys, for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like. Please give it a comment. Let me know what your biggest takeaway was from this amazing entrepreneur's interview. And if you want to see more videos just like the one you watched, click right up here because they're exactly what you need to see next. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.